Okay. So good day, everyone. This is the introduction to Barron's. Uh, the lecture, there are two PDFs. There's the Barron's extra reading, which is this lecture. And then there's the Barron selection, which goes into actually doing the math behind selecting a Barron for an application. So this Barron extras PDF that I have open here, we'll just be looking at the first uh, three slides and the rest of slides here. It will be made. It it will make more sense after doing the other lecture. Right, so that's why I have it done as extra reading. So today we're going to talk about bearings, and we could see here that we have a schematic of a basic bearing. Right, yeah, this is a normal ball bearing, and we have the inner race, the inner race, and then we have what we call the outer race or the outer ring. Right, so the inner race. Or the inner part of the bearing or the inner ring is where the shaft would be connected or be affixed to the shaft. Right, so that's the shaft going through here. So that would be where a shaft would be, where, where a bearing would be supporting the shaft. Right? Just to recall, we have a shaft, we may have some gears on the shaft. Right, so this is a shaft. Your bearings we normally indicate like this, or sometimes you would indicate it like um, if this is a shaft, you would have it drawn like this. But what you what you really is representing is the bearing supports the shaft. So you would see when we do the example next week for the uh, shaft preliminary design example or the shaft case study, we would draw the shaft. We would have the forces etc on the shaft that is arises from bell drives or chain drives or whatever and where the bearings are we will draw it like a simply supported like if it's a simple supported beam and then we will have some reaction forces so the bearing acts as a support just like how you would have a support on a beam right the outer race here of the bearing is what is affixed to the machine frame so this will actually be fit fitted into the machine the frame of the actual machine so this side is fixed Whereas the inside, of course, is rotating with the shaft. All right, so it is the relative motion between the inner rotation to the outer ring is what creates the loading on the bearing. As you could see here, as we learn from fatigue, if we have a load acting up, we could see here now that every time it rotates, the load will be going from a plus value to maybe a zero value or a negative value, depending on how the loading is. So you have fatigue happening on the actual spheres of the bearing. Right? Also, you notice you have the inner race of the ball bearing here. Right? That is where it, it rotates about. It rolls on that inner race. This, is, this surface here is what carries the load. Right? So with that high force and that constant rotation, you will have fatigue happening. And we will talk about that in the next lecture, in the next PDF. So different types of ball bearings. Right? So the one of the most common you would have, what you would see around the place is the deep groove. So it is the cheapest, it is the most common. All right, we have different um, ball bearings again for different applications. For example, we have a double row. So if it is a traditional bearing, cannot give you the support or the, the load for a certain size, then you'll have to double up them. All right, you have things called self-aligning. Now remember when you did strengths, Right, we have a beam, we have a load on the center of the beam. You see that when the beam deflects, it deflects like this. You see, these are the supports, it deflects, it will deflect like this. Right, so you have some rotation happening at the supports in a beam. So the same thing happens with a shaft. You have some angular rotation happening where the bearings of support. Right, so based on this arrangement here, you could see there's limited motion, there's limited room for a shaft to rotate or to deflect in an angular fashion. So you have things like self-aligning that will allow that general motion. You could see it have a curve in here that will allow that general motion between the shafts. So between the shaft, the and the ball bearing and the outer race. Right? Again, you have self-aligning. Then we have truss bearing. So these would be like um, your load is in this direction acting down right um, these are more like 
if it is uh, an example of this is something called a lazy Susan Baron. So you can actually check that out. Um, if you have, some of you may have a, a, a tabletop that rotates. Right? So it's, a, it's a common um, to, tabletop. That has a lazy Susan bearing or it has a, a truss bearing in it. Right, but a big one. A simple thing like a microwave um, turntable inside with the glass plate inside the microwave. And it has three rollers that rotates. So that is an example of a truss bearing. Right, it's, it's made to carry the, that vertical load. As opposed to a normal radial bearing, where the load is in this direction. That's from your reaction. A truss bearing carries a load in this direction. Truss or axial or any direction. So if we apply a high truss in this direction, we run the risk of pushing the inner race out. So we could actually disassemble the bearing. So for applications where we have high truss, we need to use truss bearings. As you could see here, where if we apply any load in this direction, well then basically all you're doing is compressing the, the sphere, which is what it's designed to do. All right, so for higher load applications where you have higher forces, for example, in your um, transmission or your gearbox in your car, you would see roller burns. So these are capable of handling much more higher loads than the ball, traditional ball burns. So in, in your fan, your compressor, um, in your air condition, you would find roller, roller ball bearings, but where you have high torque happening, high torque applications, again, for example, in your gearbox or your transmission, you will find roller bearings. Right, so things like tapered roller bearings, these are capable of handling high truss. So for example, you would find tapered roller bearings like this one, you would find this in your transmission. Because we, we could recall that when we did um, when we did gears, well not gears, but when we did shafts and we talk about gears, we see that there is an axial force and a radial force. Right? And then when we talk about helical gears, we said that um, there is a high axial force also. Right? So I could probably pull that up here and um, we could have a look at it. Okay, yeah. So this is what I'm talking about. We have the tangential force and the radial force. Right? So not axial, so it's tangential and radial force. But when we talk about helical gears now, right, and we didn't go into this, but in the transmission, for example, would have helical gears, we say now that we have a force in the axial direction. So in this direction. That was given by that. Right, if you could recall the helical gears, our gears would look like this. If you if you look at it, right, you could do a search on online and have a look at it. So the helical gears will have an axial force, trying to push into the axial direction of the shaft. So in addition to the bend, but when we have bending in the shaft, now we have something trying to push the the axial shaft. So that trying that axial force has to be carried by the bearing. And we are saying with a bearing like this, for example, we want the risk of pushing the inner from the outer. Right, so remember on top here is fixed to the machine. You will, in this case, your transmission casing. And then you have the shaft pushing against the inner direction like that, the inner race like that. Right, so with a tapered roller bearing, if we have that force being pushing, then Again, the taper of the actual roller and the inner race will actually try to resist that. So again, depending on the application, if you have a high axial thrust or axial force, then you would go with tapered roller bearing, you would go with thrust bearings. So that's the point I'm trying to make. All right, so the next section of this, I'm going to talk, I'm going to go into actual, this particular lecture now, where we're actually going to how we size a bearing base on the loads that we have. Okay, so we enter the next PDF now, bearing selection, and it's taken from uh, this textbook here, Mechanical Design and Machine Elements by Jack Collins. Right, so I selected this, this note from this textbook because it actually have a nice procedure to follow to go about doing the, the sizing. Right, so we start off with this table here. Um, this table basically goes through um, bearing type 
and what can it be used for, what it is good for. So we talk about, like, for example, deep group barbarian, which we saw in the previous PDF. So it has a good radial capacity. And what that means is that if it is we have a shaft, we have a bearing. Right, so you remember the bearing is such that the top is fixed to the machine, but the inside is free to rotate, right? So good radial load means, or radial capacity means that it can handle a, a vertical force, or a force in the radial direction. I remember we said that the bearings is what carry the reactions, and think of the shaft like a, a beam, and we have the reactions at the supports, well then that is the radial, that is the radial force, or your radial capacity. Truss capacity is when you have a load, again, in the axial direction. So something trying to push the shaft to slip through the bearing. So that is your trust. And this is a radial. Right, so the table basically goes through the different types of bearings and what you have. Um, it's radial capacity, truss capacity, limiting speed. Radial stiffness has to do with the amount of deflection again in the radial direction. Right, um, depending on the bearing type and the type of precision you want, if it is you have a very precise piece of equipment and you don't you want as limited as much as vibration as possible, then you want, you would want something that has high radial stiffness. Meaning that it will not be able to vibrate up and down like that within the bearing. Right? So the bearing themselves sometimes move. There's a slight displacement between the there are slight gaps between the, the, the balls of the bearing and the races. So what you will then happening is that they will have motion inside the bearing up and down sometimes. So that is that has to do with this that is the stiffness you're talking about. Right, so again if you want something precise, precision machine or precision piece of equipment, then you would want high radial stiffnesses. Same concept for axial stiffness. Right, you could see here that um with some truss bearings, you have truss capacity high in one direction, meaning that meaning that you could have motion in one direction and it will be able to withstand that, but if you apply the truss in the opposite direction, well then it could disassemble the bearing. Right, so this is just a guide as to where you could start to look for a bearing based on your application. When you go to a bearing manufacturer, you go to the catalogs, they will actually give you more information on that particular type of bearing or what is our best, the best type of bearing for your application. So there's no need to really memorize or, or try to really understand this. Well, you need to understand it, but try to commit this to memory. Right? With, with time and experience, you'll understand that tapered bearing is good for trust, deep groove is cheaper, but not so much trust, for example. Right, so we're going on to basic load ratings. So load ratings, of course, has to do with the rotation of the bearing and the amount of, of that radial load on an axial load that we're talking about. Right, so in bearing selection procedures and bearing manufacturers, what they have done, they have basically standardized this procedure. Depending, it doesn't matter what manufacturer it is. They all would have a basic dynamic load rating CD and a basic static load rating CS. Alright, so they would specify this these two values for your um your bearing. The CD value has to do with the fatigue life of the bearing, whereas the static load rating has to do with what is the stat maximum static load the bearing could take before failure. Alright, so to talk about that further. We have here, under basic load ratings, we have um, the different failure modes of a burn. All right, so we have two modes. We have surface fatigue, and then we have brinellin. All right, so brinellin really is
It's a benevolent permanent indentation of a hard surface. Meaning that you press down on something so hard that you actually cause permanent indentation. So if you look at a ball bearing, for example, and you if you load this high, then it's fair to if the ball itself can actually permanently indent the inner race of the bearing. Alright, so the basic dynamic load rating, CD, that CD value, is a measure of that surface fatigue failure. Alright, so the CD value is a measure of um, the rating of the bearing with regards to fatigue failure. So, of course, that CD value would be tied to revolutions, hours of operation, that sort of thing. And the basic static load rating is a measure of resistance to failure by Benelin. Right, so again, that is the permanent indentation. So the CS value is static value, is that static permanent one, that permanent value that will actually cause permanent indentation. So of course, when we size in our bearing, we want to calculate the CD value and the CS value. Right, and when you look at bearing catalogs, they will actually publish these two values. So how are we gonna use this now, this CD value, CD value and the CS value, how are we going to calculate this and then how are we going to use this in sizing our brain? All right, so we'll talk about that now. Okay, so we're talking about load ratings, and the first thing we need to talk about is the CD value and what is CD value, what this really means. All right, so CD90, as you see written here. Is defined as the largest constant stationary radial load that 90% of a group of apparently identical bearings will survive for 1 million revolutions with no evidence of failure. So what that means really is that they do test and testing these bearings, particular type of bearings, 90% of the bearings last 1 million revolutions without failure. Right, so I'll say that again. CD90 means that they took a bunch of um, bearings, the same identical bearing, and they run all of them at a certain load value, and they run all to a million revolutions. And they found that 90% of them last the million revolutions without failure and only 10 percent of them fail so that value that value of load that applied to the bearings that gave us this 90 percent at 1 million that value is called at the cd value so that's an actual load value in newtons so that's what cd 90 means all right so you will see a relationship there so how, how where is that relationship how we get that relationship and how it is we could use the CD value now in our application. Just like how in fatigue we had an endurance limit and then we had a way of manipulating that to bring it on to our application to determine, well, okay, um, our item, our beam or whatever would last the million cycles. That's what fatigue is the same concept here. So what they did, this here is life, right? This is life in terms of um, revolutions. Right, so that's all the revolutions. And this here is load. So they found that by doing experiments on a particular burn, the relationship actually looks something like this. Right, so you have your data points along the load like this. So for example, at a small um at a small number of revolutions, you could apply a large load. I suppose if you apply if you apply a small load, then it the burn could last longer. Right, so generally that relationship looks like this. Right, so it's an exponent relationship. Right, so 
But we could say now, because it's an exponent relationship, we could say PL, the equation of that line, to our power 1 over A is equal to some constant. So that's the equation of this line. Right? Some books and some literature will actually have, if you could recall, log log. So when you have an exponent, you actually have log P versus log R. I'm sorry, log L. That's a, you could recall that you could, you could, if you have a log log plot, which is what you will see in the next, in the next PDF. You could actually, using remember, using logs, you could actually get an expression, like you could actually get back this expression. What you could do is you could say, um, the equation of the line is y minus y1 is equal to the gradient, which is Right, so that's the equation of the line. So we could say um, log p because that's y minus log p1 is equal to Right, so where you have x is, is actually log L and where you have y is log P. Right, so you can remember from logs you have um, right, so that'll be P2 on P1. Right, so this will log L on L1. Right, so if we let this here, because we have P1 and P2, if we call this a constant, let's call that constant A, we could say log right, and what I'll do to make life easier, I'll call it 1 over A, so we'll get back the same thing. Is a constant, so it doesn't matter how we write it. All right, so what we could do, we could take um, anti logs. All right, so that case, we drop all the logs. Right, so this expression and this expression is the same. Right, so you could get your, your P by L to the power one over a is equal to a constant. So that's what I was really trying to show here with the log. So that's what I was able to get this expression here. Right, it might need some clean up to do with regards to the constant and all that, but essentially it, it, from the log log plot, you obtain that this expression. Right, so this here is the expression for bearing life. All right, so what we're going to do next now is go from this expression to the expression that I have any note. Okay, so we're looking at this expression here. 
right? And we identify that. Well, let's take this off so we won't confuse. We identify that from experimental purposes, experimental procedures or experiments conducted, we found that the the load versus revolutions follows a exponent curve like that. The more you increase the load on the burn, the less, of course, the revolutions it could withstand. Right? And we said that follows this equation. Now also, we say that the CD value is a value where 90% of the burns tested at that particular load CD lasts 1 million revolutions. Right? So we say in that um, P1, L1, I1 on A is equal to a constant. Right, so that's the expression from below there. So we could say that we could rearrange that. We could say L2 on L1 is equal to P1 on P2. If we rearrange to the power A, we could say that CD now is the value of the load that we are applying. That, that will, but we want us, that gives us our um, 1 million cycles. So let this be P1. And we say L1 is equal to our 1 million cycles, or 1 million revolutions. Because we're saying that the CD value, we want it to last a million, and we're saying that 90% of the burns um, fulfilling that criteria. So we have P1, we have L1. So we could say now L2 over L1, which is 10 to the power 6, is equal to CD, which is our P1 over P2, all at to the power A. Right, so know that we, we, we know that CD and 1 million, that is a bearing standard. So given that from a catalog, that the CD value for a bearing is that particular value, then we could go ahead now and calculate for any amount of operation, any amount of revolutions, or vice versa. If we apply any load P, then how much revolutions are going to last? All right, so I'll say that again. So given this expression now, if we have a certain load P on the bearing, then we could work backwards and find how long this bearing is going to last, how much revolutions. Right, so that is what we'll be using this expression for. And then there are factors that we're going to input on to it to ensure that we capture like the type of loading, the type of reliability, etc. Right, so this CD here, again, is assuming a 90% reliability. So we say 90% of the time this, this formula will be appropriate. So that's what reliability is here. So the R is 90 or 90%, right? But now there are something called reliab reliability adjustment factors. So if 90% reliability is not good enough for your application and you have a very critical application, as in the case of the aviation industry, then you want something higher than 90%. So there are factors now, something called life adjustment factors that we could multiply by that will consider now if it is you want a higher reliability. And what this factor does, it will, of course, if you want a higher reliability, it would bring down the CD value. Right, so for example, here now, let's continue. These are the reliability adjustment factors here. So for 90%, Our KR is 1, which, which makes sense. We multiply everything by 1, which is we'll be back to what we want. But as we go down now, and if we want 90% or 99%, for example, we multiply now that equation by 0 0.21. Meaning that our L value now, which was a million cycles, will now be a million times 0 0.21, which is less than a million which is like 210,000. So instead of saying that your brain is going to last a million cycles, now we say the brain is going to last 210 cycles. So we have a 99% sure 
maturity that the bearing is going to last 210,000. As opposed to saying we have a 90% surety that it's going to last a million cycles. Right, so I'll say that again. If we increase our reliability, we want something more than 90%, then we have to reduce the amount of cycles we say any bearing can last at CD. Right, so you apply a load of CD to it. Then we say we have a 99% chance it's going to last at least 210,000 revolutions. As opposed to if we go in that opposite direction, then we say, okay, we have a 50% chance, for example, that it's going to last 5 million cycles. All right, so you notice you lower the reliability, the more cycles you're saying it will last. So that is how you could actually um, select a burn and also put a percent to it now as to how much percent sure that the brain and the shaft will not, well, the brain going to last in this particular application. All right, so if it is somebody you want to say, you want to cut costs, you don't want an expensive brain. So you say, okay, I'll give you 50% reliability. It will last longer than we expected. You want to change it soon. All right, it will last up to five times the length of time, which is 5 million cycles but I could only guarantee it for 50%. Right, so that's what the reliability factor could adjust the standard value here. Right? And the reason why I have the standard value as 90% or something called L10, L10 means that 10% fail in the actual test. Right, so 90% pass, 10% fail. Right, so this 90% is a standard from manufacturer to manufacturer. And then that multiply by your, your KR value, your, your adjustment factor based on the reliability that you want. All right, so that's what they did here. They multiply the L10 by your KR value. All right, so the next step here, what I'll actually do is, um, I'll just write in something here just to give an indication of as to what are the recommended um, recommended design life for bearings? Right, so in domestic application, you're looking at about a thousand to two thousand hours. Automotive. Right, so the last one is critical equipment you're operating at around 20 24 hours you're looking at a thousand and one hundred thousand right so you notice these units are in hours right so based on we, we know that we have a million revolutions is our cd value rated at um our million is rated at the cd value Right, that's in revolutions, but based on your RPM, you could have calculate how much operating hours. And so you could actually calculate the operating hours based on based on that. You say um our operating hours LD hours is our well Right, so this here is revolutions. Therefore, yeah, hours of operation is around how much revolutions? Right, so that's how we convert from revolutions to hours. 
right, so that's how we do that conversion. All right, so the cycle we had, we say we, we said 210,000 revolutions. Well, then, based on the RPM of the machine or the shaft, we could convert that now to how much hours it's going to last. And that will give us the life in terms of hours of how long it's going to last. So when we want operation here, design life operation given in terms of hours here, as we have in um, different type of applications, based on the RPM of the machine, you could convert those hours to revolutions. And then you use these revolutions now for your calculation for size in the bearings. All right, so we're going to go through this procedure here now as to how to actually go through size in the bearings. Um, before we jump into that, there's another table here, something called impact factors. All right, and there's another factor. Um, remember when we did a um, topic with chains, chain drives, we had impact factor for the different types of application. We had like, for example, a conveyor, belt drive, gear drive, or whatever. We had, we had um, an impact factor that we multiply the load by. Well, it, we have, it's the same concept here. We have different types of application where the bearing is going to be used in. And then we have an impact factor where we multiply by. So for heavy impact on a shaft, operated piece of equipment then our impact factor between two to five so we multiply you now everything by between two to five whatever load factor in the middle you want to use maybe three or something all right so we're increasing our design parameters by doing that all right and of course we, we the bearing that will be required will be of course bigger or be able to withstand more load all right, so we're going to go into this procedure in a bit. All right, so the procedure for sizing or selecting a bearing. All right, so the first thing well, from shafts, what we would have done when sizing a shaft, we would have determined the reactions at the bearings. Right, we would have determined these things from sizing a shaft. Right, if it is we have axial loads, well then, of course, we'll have that included. Right, so this, these um, reaction forces, these are your radial loads, and it's called FR. The axial truss, again, is a forces that act in the axial direction, as you could have from, for example, the helical gears, and we call these forces F small a. Right, so these are your axial or your truss loads, and then you have your radial loads from your reaction that's supporting the shaft. The next thing we do is we, we calculate the design life requirement of the burn. Right, so this life is, is dependent on the RPM and how much hours of operation you expect. So if something needs to operate for uh, maybe a thousand hours, then at 500 RPM, well, then we use this expression to calculate our revolutions or our yeah, um, LD. Right. Next thing we look at is our adjustment factor based on the reliability that we talked about just now. And lastly, we look at the impact factor again, depending on our application. So those are our inputs into the, into the process. Right, our FR. Axial load, the LD is obtained from RPM and the number of hours. Our adjustment factor for reliability and our impact factor. All right, so this table we see in here is radial, something called radial load factors. And what this is, is and this will depend on manufacturer to manufacturer. Right? This is an ex just an example here. If we have our shaft, we have a bearing, right? So we, we say that we have our FR, our radial load or reaction load. We also have our FA, our axial truss or axial load. What these factors do, and again, these are based on empirical relations that the manufacturer will determine for their particular brand or, or type of bearing, is it, you're using, you're combining these two loads now 
into one load. Right, so I'll say it again. These factors allow these loads to be combined into one load. And we will use this one load in our calculation. So that's what this allows us to do, this relationship here. And we will see there's a sample catalog in the end. You would see that different manufacturers would give us different values for these X, X and Y. So in this table here, for example, they give two sets, D1, D2, um, D1, D1, D2, D2 for X and Y. Right? This is the expression here that you're applying it to. Right? And what this, what this means is that you have two sets. You use these values first. If it is, a, you get that value and then you, you actually use this one after. Whichever one gives the biggest PE, then you go with that one, obviously. Right, so you kind of you kind of get PE using one, and then you go PE two, and whichever one is greater, you you use that particular one. Right, but that is just in the case of this table alone. The four manufacturers they will just have most of the time this one. Right, so this PE value here calculates our dynamic equivalent load. Right, so now we can modify the equation. So we could recall our equation was basic equation was um L on ten on right, so this was our equation. Right, so making CDD subject of the formula, right, this has to be in to the power A. If we make CDD subject of the formula, then we will have P LD. So LD is our, our service life over 10 to the power 6. Right, so that's four million. And then what we do, remember we have the reliability. Remember we said we multiplying, we have this reliability that we, we would use based on what reliability we want. Right, so if for example, we said we want 99% reliability, then we multiply a million by 0.21. Right, so we just factor in that here. So we say, okay, KR, we put that in here. Right. Right, so A now becomes one on A because we bring it across the other side. And the next thing we have here now, well, we need to multiply by P, right? So in our case, we're using P, the equivalent load. Right? So the equivalent load is again calculated from factors that combine our radial load and our axial load, right? And our equivalent load now, we must consider also our impact factors, depending on the type of load. So we multiply the equivalent load by our impact factor. So that's where we end up with this expression. All right, so it starts off with this expression. We make CD the subject of the formula. All right, so if you're making CD the subject of the formula, once again, it will be um, CD on P, A, L on 10 to the power 6. All right, so 1 over A because they're transposed. CD is L on 10 to the power 6, 1 on A by P. We said that P would be our P equivalent load. You have to multiply that by our impact factor. Our L is our service life, which we multiply RPM by the, the amount of hours, multiply by 60 to get our L in terms of um, revolutions. And we said that was some from the CD value was for a million, but we have our reliability factor you want to consider. So it will be KR times 10 to the power 6. So when you substitute all these terms into here, you will actually get this equation. So this here is our equation for calculating CD. 
Right, so at this point, when you calculate CD, you actually get a value here now. Then you go to your tables. So you go to your table now and see what bearing has that CD value. I'd right, say so you're looking at CD value and you're looking at, of course, your size. I'd right, say so you're looking at these two values in your tables. And once you get something that complies with your CD and your size, then you could say that okay, the bearing is that that bearing is safe to use. Um, the next thing you would do after that is to ensure that you don't have vanillin occurring, right? And we said that vanillin has to do with this high static load of a bearing, so that is where these static factors come in, right? So that is a check we do afterwards to ensure that that high static load or that reaction load in this case here and your axial load does not cause any permanent indentation in the bearing. So this actual calculation here was to consider fatigue, whereas the static calculation is just to consider well the static case and ensure that it doesn't have any permanent indentation in the bearing. Alright, so that is what this is here. So this is a static. So again you have the same factors XS, YS and then you have your static FR essay. So those are your, your axial and radial loads. Again, and once you apply this formula and SC now, PSC, once it doesn't cross, that is what is stated for the bearing. Well, then again, the application is safe. All right, so you check, or I should say, you look up your CD value and your bore diameter. All right, so once you get these sorted and once you realize, okay, this bearing is that has, has a good CD value that corresponds to what we calculated, the bore diameter is what we want for our shaft. Then you do a check and you check the, the static load. So this is your, your procedure, your process. All right, so the best way to illustrate this is with an example which we will do now. All right, so let me just make sure. All right, so I'll do a small example first, and then we will um, we'll go into this larger example. Let's look at an example. A simple example, just using that formula. So we want to design the system for a thousand rpm operation speed and we want it to last a thousand hours we have our fr value is a thousand newtons and fa is 500. what that means is that we have a shaft we have the bearing that we need to size we have an fr value of a thousand as reaction and then we have the shaft is being pushed on by 500 newtons and we say we have light impact so that means now if you go up to light impact we go up in the impact table all right so light impact is around all here Right, so what we could do is uniform load, no impact, but we have some impact happening. So we'll use, we'll be more conservative and use a value of 1.3, right? Actually, it actually have light impact here. So between 1.2 and 1.5, so we'll use the conservative, the middle value of 1.3, right? So that's our impact factor. Right, we want 90% reliability. So we are assuming a, a single row ball bearing. Right, so if we assume in a single row ball bearing, then we go to our table. Right, so 
looking at a single row ball bearing that's that one and we will use xd now we could use x is one y d is zero or we could use these two here or we could just be conservative and use this value and this value just to be conservative right so we will do that just let's simply it safe we could say xd is equal to one and yd is equal to 1.45 right so we just use the larger values The next thing we said that is a single row ball bearing. So we're going to need a value for A. Right? And what I mean by that, A is our exponent. And we could see here, don't need to scroll up too much, exponent equal to 3 for ball bearings and 10 over 3 for roller bearings. So we delimit a ball bearing, so we use A is equal to 3. Right? So we use A equal to 3. Right? So now we can calculate our equivalent load. Right, so that is our equation that we obtained for calculating our equivalent load. That was this equation. Right, so XD is a 1, that's 1,000, plus 1.45. Right, so our equivalent load is 17.25 newtons. So that's our equivalent load on the bearing, meaning that based on the, the bearing arrangement, the, how the, the balls are arranged in the bearing, again, based on manufacturing, that will be, based on the manufacturer, that will be different. We could say that we have an equivalent load, P, that combines the 500 and the 1000. And so next we use the CD relationship. So we say CD is equal to the equation that was written there, 10 to the power 6 here, 1 over A, impact factor, then our equivalent load. Right, so I'll just add another page. Right, so this is the e expression. So CD is equal to, well, first, before moving on to CD, we need to calculate our LD. So LD, we said was hours by RPM by 60. And the example said a thousand hours operating at a thousand rpm. So it's a thousand hours, a thousand rpm by sixty. Right, so our LD is expected to make sixty by ten to the power six revolutions. Or sixty million revolutions. Alright, so clearly remember our C D value was size for a million revolutions. So therefore now our CD value, as we have to calculate, it will obviously be a lot higher than our PE value. Right? But we will see that. So CD is 60 by 10 to the power 6 over KR. Right? Now if we call KR was our reliability factor and for 90%, it was 1. Right? So that's again, let's say cap where I got that from. KR 90%, the KR value is 1. All right, so that will be 1 times 10 to the power 6. All this is to 1 over 3 because we said A was 3. Impact factor was 1.3. And our PE value was 17.25. So, right, so when we multiply all this here, our CD value should be 87. 67 newtons so what this means that this so this is the dynamic load rating we will look for in the bearing tables All right, so this example just shows us how to use the formula to cut the CD. So then what we will do, we are going to our bearing table, which you will see just now. Uh, our bearing table looks like this. So you see there's the bearing number, for example, you have the bore, you have the outside diameter, you have the width, so you have the, the geometric um, parameters. 
and then you have your load rating. So this is your CD value. So the value we just don't calculate for CD, that is what we're going to look for here. Right? Um, the CS values now, again, at the after we calculate the CD value, or we determine a CD value, we determine a burn, then we go now and we cross check to make sure that we don't have the vanilla happening or the static indentation happening. So to do that, we calculate the static load and we compare it to the to the CS values here. Right, this here is the limiting speed, meaning that limiting speed in this case here is 10 to the power 3, which is what a thousand RPM. Right, so you're looking at with grease and with grease and with oil. So if the bearing is in oil, for example, if you look at this bearing here, if the bearing is in oil, it will it could rotate up to 30,000 RPM. But if the bearing is being lubricated with traditional grease, then it will only be allowed, well, only safe operation is allowed at 24,000 RPM. So that's what your bearing tables look like. All right, so the CD value we calculated, we will look for that along here. All right, we will verify that the CD value that we get, or that we, we, we find that is close to, is in line with the diameter of the shaft. Right, so we have the bore diameter, we have the CD value, and once those two things checked out, then we calculate the static load and compare it to what we have here for that particular bearing size. And then we could say, well, good, the bearing is size, and that will go with that actual bearing number. All right, so we'll actually go through an example, an actual example where we could actually select a proper value. The example we just now did was to show how to use the equation to calculate CD. So we move on on to doing this example. Okay, so we're gonna look at an actual example as to how we go about size, size and a burn for a particular application. So in this, this question here, we have an uh, agricultural piece of equipment and the found that in sizing the shaft, the shaft diameter is the minimum shaft diameter, the location of the bearing is 1.6. Um, how did they get that? If you were to recall the shaft's um, lecture, we saw that we have come down to the end here in this actual lecture. We have some diameters here. So we have some methods that calculate the minimum shaft diameters. So these big equations here determine the minimum shaft diameter at a particular location. And so for example, we have a shaft here. We have the bearings. These are the bearings. We said that the torque would go through the shaft. So at this point here, at this point here, there's no torque in the shaft. There's torque in the shaft from this region here. But at the location of the bearings, there, there, there are no torques. And also, we know from a simply supported beam that at the supports, the bending moment is zero. So at this point here, the bending moment is zero. And also, the torque in the shaft is zero. So because of that, now, if we were to use this equation, well, the bending moment is zero, and the, shock, the, the torque is zero, so you end up getting zero. But in that case where the major load, load in is shear, then we need to use this particular equation. All right, so this equation will work in this example, well, not this example for bearing, but this for this arrangement of the shaft. This equation would work and give us our minimum diameter. So that is how they were able to obtain a minimum diameter at the bearing at 1.6 inches. All right, the radial load is 370, actual load is 130. We said that the shaft speed is 350. And the design life specifications says that you're looking at 10 years of operation, working at 50 days a, a year, and every day we work in 20 hours a day. So what that means is that if you have the convert that into hours, working on 20 hours a day, by 50 days a year, by 10 years. So this would give us, in terms of hours. And then you use LD, 
is equal to ours by RPM by 60 to give us our revs. And they give us our reliability, they want 95% reliability. So for 95%, we go up to our reliability. And we say, okay, for 95%, we're looking at 0 0.62. So our KR value, sorry, where is it? Our KR value is 0 0.62. The shaft is to be v bell -Jivan. So we go up at our impact factor chart, which is this here. We set up a V belt is between 1.2 and 2.5. So we would use the middle range again. We use the middle of that range. Actually, right, so the middle of that range should, should be around 1.9. Our impact factor. And so we have everything we need here right now to calculate the CD value. Right, and we're using our rolling element, a roller ball bearing, so we know A is equal to 3. Right, so now we could proceed with the actual calculation of the CD value. This here is calculating LD. Again, this is what I went through 50 days by 20 hours a day by 10 years. Right, we have multiply by 60, multiply by RPM. Right, so it's the hours would be, again, would be at the RPM, we said it's 350 RPM. And then we multiply by 6 years to the formula. So this is 2.8 or 2.1 by 10 to the power 8 revolutions. We've expected that this bearing is to endure for its lifetime. We said that the KR value was 0.62, which we determined, and we said the IF value is 1.9. Right, so we're using a single row deep group ball bearing. Right, so we're only looking at A for now. Single row deep group ball bearing. So for that type of bearing, go real up to here. And these were our factors. Right, so one zero and then all point five five and one point four five. So in the example that we did before. We are just pulled out the larger of the two values. So the larger one for XD and the larger one for YD. So that's what we did before. Right? But that could lead to over design and all that, right? I just wanted to illustrate the use of the equation. Right? So what they did here now, they went with first XD1, YD1, which is 1 and 0. And then they calculate again PE for 0.55 and 1.45 for XD2 and YD2. So that's what they did here. And they said, okay, we will use the larger of the two values, which is 392. Right? We have our FR and we have our FA in the equation. So they use PE as 392. So plugging everything in the formula, we have our LD. We have our KR. We have 10 to the power 6. We have our impact factor. And we have our equivalent of PE. So by calculating everything, um, my A was 3, we get our CD value as 51.92 pounds. All right, so the CD value is 51.92 pounds or 5.192 by 10 to the power 3 pounds. All right, all right, slide up because that's where the table have it. And our bore diameter, is one was 1 1.6 inches so this is what we're looking for in our table so we go up to our bearing table all right and i'll just keep this on top here all right so these are what we're looking for 5.192 by 10 to the power 3 for cd and the diameter must be 1.6 inches. So we go down on the, the, the we go down on our board diameter and we, we keep looking. Right? 1.6 inches, again, we said that was the minimum diameter of the shaft at that point. 
we cannot go smaller because we're seeing the shaft would fail if you were to go to smaller. If you were to go to, for example, 1.3, we're expecting the shaft to fail. So we're looking at 1.6 or above. All right, so again, this is our minimum diameter at that point. So we look at for 1.6, we see we have 1.57. Right, again, that is 1.57, that is not 1.6. We can just assume that they rounded off. So the next one we go to is 1.77. So that's the next block on the chart. All right, so those are the bearings you're looking at, at 1.77. You're looking at the CD value. So the CD value, 4.6 here, will that be too small? 7.46. So 7.46 is larger than the 5.192, which is what we're looking for. And then we have the size here as 1.77, which is greater than 1.6. So in all in all, we're looking at this particular bearing, 6209. All right, so the 6209 gives us a CD value of 7.46 and our CS value of 4.86. All right, so remember we said that we look for diameter, we look for CD, and when we select the bearing, then we calculate our CS value and compare it. All right, so we will calculate the CS value now. Um, you can see that the, the RPM, which is 7,500 RPM to 9,000 RPM, so it's far above our 350 RPM that we had. All right, so that specified 350 RPM, so we're way beyond that. So we'll call the 6209 burn. Right, and the last thing to do now is to check and make sure that our static load is within the limit. So we go to our static load calculations. Right, so we again we're using the same equation that I highlighted in the, the procedure. So we look for the excess and virus value. So excess and virus value. Again, we come back to our major table for a single row ball bearing. All right, so we're looking at 1 and 0, just as before, 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.5. So our equivalent static load is calculated here, 1 and 0 or 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.5. So again, they did it for two regions. They did it for PSE1 with the 1 and 0, and then they did it for the point six and point five. So you could see in this case here, three seventy is greater. So we'll use three seventy. So if we look at the PSE value, it's three seventy pounds, and we pull that up in our bearing table. We could see that four point, sorry, we could see that four point eight six is far. This actually is zero point three seven by 10 to the power three. All right, so you could see 0.37 is far less than the 4.86. So that means the 6209 is a good bearing. So you could actually highlight this and say, okay, we could go with, we could go with the 6209. So we write down our details where we know the 6209 bearing was 1.7717 inches. All right, so we got a 6209 bearing. The diameter is given by that, 1.77 inches. All right, and the bearing catalog will actually give you more details. So this here is an actual SKF bearing catalog. All right, so you could see, for example, this is the bearing number. All right, so this is just highlighting for one bearing here. It gives the dimensions. All right, it gives you C. Rating. Now, this is a CD value, right? So sometimes you don't write CD, it is a dynamic and C, static C naught. Right, so you can see a limiting speed for this particular bearing here, the 7203 is 20,000 RPM, which is very high. It gives you the, the dimensions, right? Um, also, going further on this table, like if you were to go on to the next page of the table, they will actually give the recommended fits for the shaft and housing, meaning that what should the what type of fit should we use? So if we I don't think we talk about fits and tolerances. I don't think we'll be doing that in this 
um, in this course. But the fits and tolerances would actually tell you what how you should machine your shaft then to fit on to this bearing. All right, so you could see here also in terms of insulation, actually give the shoulder and what the radius of the shoulder would be. So by selecting the bearing, now you're actually putting this now in your shaft calculation. And you know based on the based on your radius of your, your based on this radius, you'll actually determine your stress concentration if you have a step shaft. Alright, so your calculation factors. So you just saw we had the the XD and YD and all that just now. They actually give that on the catalog. Alright, so that those are these values here. X and Y. X naught, Y naught. If they don't give an X naught, well then it's one. Again, they, they will actually tell you these things in the catalog. Alright. A lot of times the bearings would have um based on the loading, they will actually tell you what equation to use. So they would actually tell you how to calculate this. If you go on a bearing website. Right, because again for manufacture the manufacture because these are empirical relations it will be the fun for bearing manufacturer to bearing manufacturer all right so in this particular bearing you calculate e right so e is this 1.14 value and if e is if the ratio of the actual to the radial is greater than that e then you use one equation if it's less than you use a different equation all right so it have the font caveats in, in using the actual procedure highlighted today, but the brand cutler will actually go through as to what is the particular equation to use, when to use it. But generally, this is the procedure that we did today. Right, so this concludes bearing, um, bearing sizing, and you will have to do this. I will talk about this a little more when I go through the shaft preliminary design example. And then you will have to again use this for when doing the design practice and also when doing the assignment tree, the step-by-step -step process. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to forward the questions on to you could use the discussions in Canvas or you could send my message. So on discussions on Canvas, I mean, everyone should be able to see it. So everyone will benefit from your question.